Well, the word that the Lord has for us tonight is in Matthew 5 and verse 6, if you want to turn there. Matthew 5, verse 6. The title he gave me before he gave me the message was, Tell My People Always to Carry a Large Bucket. Now, if a farmer's going to milk a cow, you know what it means to carry a large bucket. Let's read the text first of all. Blessed are they which hunger and thirst after righteousness. The promise is they shall be filled. Well, Faith Assembly ought to know about Matthew 5, 6 from experience. Both the hunger and the thirst and the filling. You never get filled to the point you can't receive more, but... God just keeps feeding and feeding and filling and filling. So God said, always carry a large pail or bucket, or basket if you like the term. You know, if a farmer goes to milk a cow and takes a little bucket about the size that he puts cream in that holds maybe a pint, that's all he's going to get from the cow. Now, it doesn't mean the cow doesn't have more to deliver, but he can only receive that pint Because if he tries to get any more, he's just going to spill it and lose it on the ground. And so the cow has the capacity. He can deliver, or she can. (laughs) I'm not that much of a city boy. She can deliver. (laughs) Growing up in Louisville, that's not exactly a rural area. But I do know about cows. They're female. (laughs) Bulls are mean, the males. (laughs) But anyway, if he takes the pint bucket, that's all he can get is a pint. Doesn't mean the cow can't deliver more. So he doesn't take a pint bucket. He takes a big bucket that will hold, well, several quarts so that he can receive all that the cow has to offer or God has to give him through that instrument, that animal. And so it is with the Word of God. You see, he may give us a lot to give you, but if you carry a small basket or a little bucket, then... Whatever we give you over and above what your little bucket will hold, you know, your heart, you'll lose it, you'll spill it, and it will do you no good. In fact, we've wasted our time in preparation, and God has wasted his time sending Jesus to the cross and sending down the Holy Spirit to teach us these things. So the implication from the subject that God gave us, always carry a large bucket, the implication is that people generally get about what they expect to receive. Nothing new there. We've been saying that all along for years. You get generally about what you expect to receive, whether it's good or bad. I wonder if you've ever noticed how most people come to a meeting and give away by their attitude and looks, and sometimes where they sit, here are front row people. He comes all the way every week from Indianapolis. Look where he is. Every week on the front row. And I know some of you have to sit back there because you're children, so just let me use it as an illustration and don't be offended because you're back there somewhere else. But if you noticed how some people will come to a meeting, they get there early enough to get up front. I used to do that. When I go to a meeting, I'm on the first or second row, always was. When I got the Holy Spirit, started to go to these charismatic meetings, I had my tape recorder and I was right up front. I didn't want to miss a thing. As a result, I didn't. I got a revelation and a prophecy and a supernatural call to this end time ministry of faith, which may not have happened if I'd been, you know, over in a corner somewhere. As one did that I got acquainted with in Dallas when I first heard the faith message, and he said, I don't know whether I can trust this guy or believe him or not. Well, I said, I'm not having a bit of trouble. I'm just eating up like a starving man. And as a result, I got this supernatural call to a supernatural word. This word is supernatural. But have you noticed how some people will come to a meeting and they get there so they can get everything? And they come in with a big smile on their face and they're exuberant and they have an air of expectation around them and you can almost read their thoughts. I wonder what God has for me tonight. Praise the Lord for what he's going to show me again, it'll just bring me a step farther in my preparation. And I don't want to miss one of these meetings because I'll have a gap in my preparation. And he says to the fellow next to him, is this seat taken? I need a place to put my big bucket beside me 
so I don't lose any of this bread that's going to be baked and served tonight. And then others, have you noticed how they come in dragging their little tiny buckets behind them on a string like a child who's been at the beach all day with his little pail and shovel and he's worn out all day at the beach in the sun. They will sink down, get the terminology, sink down in their chairs with a sigh saying, who praise God for a church I can come and rest in. been a busy week and they've got every intention of resting and God won't let you rest not in this end time with his word you know that from being at faith assembly there's no rest here oh there's rest in the Lord you know what we're saying but you can't really rest at faith assembly or where the words coming forth sometimes I try to listen to some of you guys when I eat and I just have to turn you off because it's not an eating message <laughs> You know, some where they're just teaching along fine and you get blessed, but some of them, man, they're really laying down and you've got to conform, you've got to digest it, you've got to chew on it and get all you can out of it and you can't do that while you're trying to eat your lemon meringue pie or whatever. <laughs> Food and the Word of God sometimes doesn't go together is what I'm saying, that it's too serious. But they'll say, praise the Lord, now I can rest and... Oh, I wonder what God is going to give us that's new tonight that I'll probably have to lay on the shelf. And, oh my, I don't have much room. Look up there on the shelf, the things I've <laughs> laid up there now that I'm going to get to later sometime if the Lord tarries. The Lord's willing. Well, he's willing, but the people say that. Then he says to his neighbor, I wonder what we're going to have to do tonight or change next week or conform to or give up and he'll say, well, I know what you mean, but maybe God will be easy on us tonight. Well, you better find another church because he's never easy on us at Faith Assembly, whether it's myself speaking or someone else. I mean, if it's just a nice little rejoicing, teaching, praise the Lord message, you still, if you're listening to it, and generally you can't get it once, people write us, they have to listen to the tapes several times at least to glean from them what God is trying to say to them. But whatever the message, if it's God's word, uncompromising word, and you listen to it, you're going to have to hear it with more than just your ears or your head. But how people tell what the size of their bucket is by their attitude. Some people go to a seminar or an end time meeting somewhere and come dragging in at the last minute. As I say, I always got the front row. I was in Dallas. I was there for three weeks and I never failed to get a seat either on the front or second row. I saw to it. I got there ahead. I got the tape recorder all tuned up and those were the days when you didn't just punch a button but you had to carry recorders, you know. Maybe they had tubes in them and all of that. Transistors were a little too new but whatever. I made sure that I got what God had sent me there to get. God can only give us what we are willing and prepared to receive. And only you can determine what the size of the basket or pail or bucket is of your interest that you bring to the meeting. Like tonight. Just like tonight. You see, you can look out sometimes and tell where the interest really lies and what kind of interest it is. As we've said before, you know, sometimes you don't look back at the same spot. I remember back in my denominational seminary days when I was a member of a little Baptist church and when the pastor was away once or twice a year, generally I guess it would be once, he would invite me to speak while he was away. And speaking of people's interests and the size buckets they carry, I saw this way back then. This is way back in the 50s. And I remember one time when he invited me to speak how that I spoke on 1 Corinthians 15, which is 58 verses, on the resurrection. Well, it's one subject in that chapter, and since I only got to speak about once a year, I dealt with the whole chapter. I thought that was logical. <laughs> one subject, and so the whole chapter was on it. And one of the members of his church, well, it was the church where I went to during seminary days, between pastorates, 
she came to me wheezing and said, oh, my head's just swimming. Our pastor gives us the word of God in little doses. He deals with just a verse or two a week. And here you came in like a whirlwind and gave us a whole chapter. And 1 Corinthians 15 is one of those long chapters. And she was just puffing and panting and, you know, really a little bit offended. And I started to defend myself, you know, in the sense of, well, how are you going to deal with the subject of the resurrection? 1 Corinthians 15, when the whole chapter's on it, and if I deal with it, you know, as he does, a verse or two a week, and they're 58 verses and I only get to speak once a year, I'll be 29 years. <laughs> that would just be flesh, so I didn't say it. And I didn't have to say it because I looked down at her side and I saw she had a little baby bucket on a string dangling at her side, about the size of a frozen orange juice can. <laughs> and after I'd covered one or two verses of 1 Corinthians 15, she had spilled all the rest and lost it. And if you look around her chair, you'd see all of that precious bread just lying there going to waste. You will get about what you expect to get. You know, if God intended to give us the longevity of the Old Testament saints, many of whom lived to be about a millennium, Methuselah, 969 years. And if he didn't intend to use us for another millennium, then he could continue to feed us, you know, on the milk and the pablum, baby-sized portions, spoon-fed a week at a time. But because the hour is so short, God's got a method to do this quick end time work in us if we'll let him and it's not to make our heads bigger so we can receive more teaching but to admonish us to carry bigger buckets to the meetings so that we can receive all he has and we'll not lose a thing and this is Paul's meaning in Hebrews 5 and 6 where he says leave those first principles of the word of God and go on to maturity go on to perfection or become a mature saint and then you remember the analogy in 1 Corinthians 9 of the runner in the race where Paul said it's only the disciplined person, the one who gives himself to rigorous training, who runs with all he or she has that wins the race. So the question is, and we've got a tape on the subject I would recommend you listen to, are you a runner or spectator? And if you're not just a spectator listening to sermons in church on Sunday and you're a runner, then how are you running? Now, I don't know about you, but I don't dare do as some people do and take for granted because they believe in the Lord. You know, Matthew 7, many will say, Lord, Lord, we believe in you and we did religious works. And he'll say, I don't know you. I only know those who seek to know and do the will of God because only those will enter the kingdom of God. I don't dare take a chance on thinking that I've made adequate preparation, that I'm running as I should. I don't dare do as some I see walk along half alive with their little old thimble-sized buckets on a string who have an appetite for this life-giving word of God that we serve you every week, more than once a week, have an appetite about like a sparrow. You know, they peck a little here and peck a little there. Then they're filled and satiated after just a few bites. I mean, you know, they have like 10 or 15 minute baby bucket interest and you lose them after that. I don't dare take a chance. I appreciate what one sister said. Oh, it's been a few months ago. She was from another state. And she comes up when she can. I'd been stressing the importance of the word of God. And she came up after, wasn't asking for anything, but she just said, you know, that's my desire because we were expressing how some delight in the word of the Lord and in his word they meditate day and night and others, well, they're not opposing the word but they're just kind of lukewarm about it and they're sitting around and hoping they'll make it in because they believe in Jesus. And she said, I have this hunger for the word of God. She said, I listen to tapes constantly and she meant the right kind of tapes. She meant tapes from Faith Assembly. And she said, I listen to them constantly. That's all I want, the word of God. I just want to have my mind saturated with that. I don't have any interest in anything else. And you know, I thought on the way home, I thought while she was saying it, but I said to the Lord on the way home, how precious, how beautiful a sister like that. 
that her only desire is to be fed on the Word of God. And in fact, I just read a letter today from her, how that she said it's the Word from Faith Assembly, God's Word, which has sustained me. It's the only reason I'm alive. And we get so much mail like this that it's the Word of God that sees the person through. It's not a choice you have about being hungry for the Word, enough to bring a big bucket or bringing a small bucket. It's a matter of life and death. So anyway, that's what she said. Oh, Lord, you know, I just want your Word. I want my mind saturated with it. And I said to the Lord, that's precious, that's beautiful, that's what I want. And of course, that's what I've been wanting. Do you know what it is to cry out to the Lord, actually agonize and groan in the Spirit with utterings that can't be uttered to the Lord, that you've got to have more of His presence in your life. You've got to go deeper into His Word. Doctrine has its place, but I mean to go deep in His Word to where it becomes your very life. Shortly after that experience, been a few months ago, as I was one day weeping before the Lord, Sometimes I don't know why I was in the midst of the preparation of a message and I was weeping before the Lord and saying that I had to have more of His presence, had to go deeper. Now some people say, you know, you go deep, but I'm talking about for myself to go deeper into His Word, to experience His Word, not just to know it, but to experience it. And in this crying out to the Lord, He dropped into my heart what we read here in Matthew 5 and verse 6. He said to me, Blessed are they that hunger and thirst. After righteousness, He said, They shall be filled. Well, I'd read that verse many times. But He was speaking that to me. You're hungering and thirsting after me, after the Word, after righteousness. You shall be filled. And then He gave me a vision. And in the vision, I saw a huge... Fat man. Now, I don't mean fat, fat. I mean fat like a balloon. In fact, he was so fat, his head looked like a little golf ball. I want to show you, you can't all see it, but I want to show you what he showed me in vision. And no comments on the artwork. And you can't see it on tape, those who hear the tape, but just think of a big balloon and the man's head in proportion about like a golf ball. Now, no reflection on anyone present because no one would look quite like that. But <laughs> it isn't the Lord has a sense of humor or doesn't. I believe he has at times. But the point is, he said to me, spiritually, that's what those who hunger and thirst after righteousness are going to look like. They're going to be filled. <laughs> filled like you would fill a balloon with air. And he was illustrating his point. I actually saw that. And he said, you're going to be fed spiritually until you're filled. Not filled like you're filled when you eat a good meal you enjoyed like no other meal. And you said, oh, I can't have another portion of dessert. I'm filled. Not filled like that, but fed and fed and fed and fed on himself and his word until you literally become fat on righteousness. The Old Testament uses that term again and again about being fat you know, in a spiritual way. Fatness, being a blessing, as well as sometimes you use it in the opposite way. But anyway, it's a spiritual term in the Old Testament. And you'll be filled with God, with all the fullness of God, Ephesians 3 and 4. You'll be filled till you grow up to the measure of the stature of Christ. You'll be filled with His righteousness, filled with His presence, satiated with God and His Word. I wonder if you know what we've got here in our hands, you know, this holy word. Do you really understand what God has given us in this book? His holy word. And as I was in this state of worshiping the Lord and crying out and weeping before him, thence when he gave me a direct revelation to my spirit about what this word is that we have. And as I said before, it's like Paul in 2 Corinthians 12. He said, I saw things that I can't communicate. And whether he meant he couldn't tell it because he was forbidden 
or that there are no words in human language to express what he saw when he was caught up into paradise, the third heaven. It doesn't matter because he still couldn't describe it. And so it is, there's no way really to communicate except I'll tell you what God said. They're just words. And I trust that your spirit can pick it up. As I was weeping before the Lord in this revelation he was giving me in the vision and all, he showed me how awesome now think of the words, because we're limited to human language. Awesome was his holy word. And what a fearsome responsibility we have to believe it all, to obey it all, and to teach it all without any compromise, regardless of what anyone thinks, whether it's your family, your friends, or institutional religion, or charismatic religion, or whatever kind. And as he was revealing this to my spirit, and it was a revelation of the awesomeness of this word that he's entrusted us with, my spirit cried out, my God, my God, who's sufficient to handle such a great responsibility? It should be ministered by your holy angels, not men. And that Jesus Christ himself, I said to the Lord, Jesus Christ himself alone is worthy to speak this word. You know what he said to me? He said, I know that better than you. But nevertheless, I have ordained that my holy word is to be ministered to men by men. And that we are to be very careful and very faithful and very humble before it. We are to handle his word with such reverence and such respect that will not let one jot or tittle fall to the ground. Bring your big buckets, he said, to receive it all. And that we do not concern ourselves as the teachers and ministers of the word with one iota of what people think about what God has said, but we concern ourselves only with pleasing God in the way we present the word. And then I began to prophesy, and since I was by the typewriter, I set it down, and that was his intention because it's basically to the ministers and then, of course, to the whole church. And here's the prophecy that he gave me. And often, as I have prophesied, I've been by a typewriter where I could write it. In fact, our tract on the baptism of the Holy Spirit is a prophecy, as you may have noticed. He said, Hear ye ministers, saith the Lord. You are here and now challenged by me to examine your hearts and answer truthfully. Do you have my call upon your life to minister my word? Or have you as some been moved by emotion and sentimentality and placed yourself in this holy, awesome office? Know this, whether or not it is my call or your call, that my word warns in James 3 and verse 1, let not many of you seek to become teachers, knowing that ye shall receive the greater judgment. Thus the self-appointed teacher shall receive not only the greater judgment of the divinely appointed teachers, but a judgment he has appointed unto himself by appointing himself to a holy office. I did not set him in. Now, there was more, and I'll give you it in a moment, but if that warning encourages anyone who thinks or is saying he's been called to teach God's Word, to minister God's Word, if it encourages any of you to step down from an office you know God has not set you in, then instead of feeling bad, get on your knees and praise and thank God that he opened your eyes in time because you spared yourself two judgments. A judgment that he tells us all ministers will get about how they dealt with his word, and that's serious. But you'll spare yourself a judgment that you appoint yourself to by being in an office he didn't set you. I told many of these ministers that I've counseled with in the past few weeks, I asked them, do you believe God has called you into the ministry of his word? He's called the whole body into ministry, but I'm talking about a special ministry of his word. If you believe that, then you'll know you're called if you can't do anything else. I told them if you can do anything else, you're not called. That is, do anything else permanently and be happy in it. God hasn't called you. 
If you can drive a bus and be happy driving a bus, then God hasn't called you to his word. Oh, you can witness to people on the bus. Everybody here should, if you're a bus driver. But if you find yourself preaching sermons and they're going to fire you because you're trying to do two jobs, then you're probably not called to be a bus driver, but a preacher of the word. But the point is, if you can do anything else, do it. God doesn't call anyone to do anything else. Jonah found that out. And while we are witnessing in this 20th century religious activism which encourages people to come to the altar and dedicate their lives to full-time Christian service, and they're always telling people in the churches, are you sure you're not called to preach or to teach God's Word and go to the religious school or the seminary or the Bible school? And while they're encouraging people to get into the ministry, we're preaching, you better examine your heart and your supposed call, and we're discouraging you to get into the ministry. If you can do anything else, you better do it. Now, if God's called you, you can't do anything but preach the Word. So there's no problem. We tell you to flee the judgment to come. They're saying come to the altar and dedicate your life. We're saying your life ought to already be dedicated. We're all witnesses. We're all evangelists. There is a ministry, an office of evangelism, but how did you get here? I'm no evangelist, so I wasn't preaching on the corners of the streets, and you heard it and you came. It's because somebody there evangelized you. Oh, I know there are other ways you got here. You may have heard tapes or read the literature or whatever, but I'm saying we're all evangelists. That's what a witness to the Word is. But while others are encouraging people to get into the ministry, we're encouraging you to get out unless God placed you there. And then the Lord continued to say in this prophecy I wrote down, He said, Tell my ministers to fill large buckets with my truth and take to their meetings to feed my sheep. And tell my people to bring the largest buckets they can find to receive what the Spirit has for them. And He impressed upon me that ministers who carry small buckets, and many if not most do, Small buckets to their meetings with their little 15, 20-minute sermonettes and the rest of its religious program and entertainment. That if the ministers are carrying small buckets to their meetings, they can't fill the large buckets of those faithful who come with that hunger and thirst for righteousness. They can't satisfy them. And you can't fill your bucket with truth until you first fill your heart with it. And that takes some time. It takes some prayer. It takes considerable study and preparation. I never preach a sermon, teach a message that I haven't spent over a week on. I've had people say, oh, you could just get up and talk extemporaneously from now on. Yes, perhaps. That isn't the way God does it. So I get my messages fresh, and I give them to you fresh, and it takes preparation. This message you're getting tonight, I started Friday a week ago. And all I got was, tell my people to carry a large bucket. And from then on, he starts giving, and then it's all that time. That's over a week. That's Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Anyone count that? That's a whole lot of days. And I've got almost 30 years in deep study of the Word and theology. I've got a doctor's degree in theology, and yet I can't come to you unprepared. Nothing else interferes with my preparation. I get that done first. I don't care if you have to mow the lawn or go get a tire fixed or repaired or whatever. The Word comes first. I can't even rest. I can't even feel at ease until I've prepared in the Word for that day. I'm just trying to make a point that God is the one that's speaking to you tonight. is not Hobart Freeman and telling you ministers carry a large bucket filled with God's truth. And you people who are sitting there to receive it, bring large bucket interests to the meeting. And God, I believe, has made me aware that not all of the ministry in this body is diligent as they should be about preparation in the Word of God. And if God's speaking to your heart, minister friend, you know that he doesn't always speak twice, and he's been speaking several times the past few months to ministry as well as to the whole body. But the point is that you can't put God's preparation second. 
What have you got? Maybe a meeting or two a week? Or even three? You can preach the same message. Generally, that's the way it goes. I had seven meetings a week when I first received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, if God had a special word for a special location, that's another thing. But my point is that what they needed over in Fort Wayne, they needed down in Muncie. Or in Greenfield, Ohio, we had a circuit we traveled. And generally, that's true. But then when I get back to my church, it wouldn't always be that message because they would have a need that maybe these teaching sessions didn't have or God wanted to say something to them. And people sometimes would say, why do you teach a different subject? I had Muncie, Richmond, and Anderson, Indiana, and they're pretty close. I said, well, I've got people that come from Muncie that go over to Anderson, so why should they hear what I gave them on Friday night, Saturday morning? So I would change the study for their sake but if you've only got a meeting or two a week, or if you had seven and you're moving around, I mean, you're not in the same place. The temptation can be to ministers, since they don't have to punch a clock, you see, to neglect their responsibility to the Lord. You know, maybe none of us would ever know it, except it'll come out in the messages eventually, but God knows. And you just can't do your own thing. There's nothing that is more important than the Word of God. You make sure that you fill your heart with a lot of truth, and then you can bring a big bucket to the meeting to give to the people. And I want to say that if you don't do that, you keep neglecting, he's going to come and talk to you about it, and not through me. He's got a little board of education he uses, just like your parents. It's called chastisement. But people who come to the meeting with a big bucket need someone who's prepared a big bucket full of truth. But for those who have baby bucket interests who bring their little buckets, they're satisfied, you know, with their little tiny buckets. That's all they're ever going to receive, both now and in eternity, because you've got to develop a capacity now for the things of God. Do you know what it is to be almost so all stricken of the Word of God you're afraid to touch it? Because you realize what He has given to man that only the holy angels dare touch, and Jesus Christ alone is worthy to speak it. And he said, I know that better than you. But I've ordained that men shall hear my word by men, by my people, through my people. Therefore, you better be faithful to it. You better be awe-stricken before it. You better reverence it. We won't even get into these people who talk about it not being inspired and all of that. If you ever get a revelation in your spirit about what we're dealing with here, you won't neglect preparation. You'll realize you're going to come into that judgment of James 3, 1, one day. And I'll tell you, I'm not trying to present myself as someone who is perfect or infallible, but I do have a great fear before this word. That's why I would never speak another word in the pulpit if I didn't believe it was the word of the Lord. I wouldn't cross the street for all the power, glory, wealth of this universe to say a thing to God's people or anyone else with respect to spiritual values unless I believed that it was what God had said in his word. And so the message is entitled, Always Carry a Large Bucket. Why? Well, because if the minister brings a large bucket to feed you with, then you won't spill any of it. You won't lose any of it. And I want to say what you lose that God offers you is lost. Oh, I know some probably think that's a little strong, but you know it just keeps getting stronger every week. You see, what you lose from your little bucket, baby bucket interest, what you lose because, well, I had company and I didn't want to embarrass them because they wouldn't understand if I invited them to faith assembly. I don't know about you, but I've met too many people that never occurs to them to come on anyway and leave them sitting there. Say, so see you after church. Church comes first. My church comes first. And you grab your big bucket and head out for faith assembly so you don't lose any of that bread and have a gap in your preparation. Don't let the devil deceive you. You can make it up on a tape later. Not if it's because of your neglect. And I'll tell you why. Because the Holy Spirit has to give you the meaning and understanding of that word. 
And if it's on a tape, you can hear it a hundred times and never get the message he was trying to give you there in faith assembly because you weren't there. I'm talking about where it's just disinterest, lukewarmness, and whatever excuse. Ooh, look at that snow, somebody says. It's a half inch deep. I don't know. We better watch between now and when we usually go to church, see if we can make it. Now, I've noticed during this heavy fog, I've said to you when I'd come here, I'd say, praise God for all these faith people who do not let fog discourage them. But I will say one thing, the parking lot is not as full on those foggy nights or snowy nights. Now, I mean, it's mostly full. I'm just saying the thought is, and you reject it because you don't want to vocalize it. Well, some do have faith. They've got the message, but some have faith when it's fair weather. So it must be fair weather faith. It's not faith for the fog or faith for the snow or faith for the ice. Or well, praise the Lord, most are here, but not all are here. And so I'm saying God does not have any makeup exams like in high school or college where, well, I missed it, but, you know, I can always get it off a of tape. You can't get it off a of tape if the Holy Spirit doesn't give it to you off the tape. Hearing the word, they're just words. It's the letter of the word. And you can't say, now, Lord, now that I've gotten out of the way what I think is important, now that I have gotten out of the way my first priorities, now I want to do a study of the Word. I think I'll get into theology or Greek or Hebrew. Let me quickly add a parenthesis. We're not talking about if you're away for a valid reason or a vacation or a rest. I do that myself. We're talking about baby bucket interest. That after you're about 10 minutes in the message, you're up, and I've seen it in all the meetings. They get up out of their chair and then they start walking around like a zombie. <laughs> Got to get a drink. Can't take too much of this strong medicine without water. It won't go down. <laughs> or out and get a fresh air. When I was back in the Baptist pastorate, they'd go out and take a smoke between <laughs> points of your message. Oh, yeah. You go to any Baptist church, you'll find a worn out spot on the corner of the building. That's where the deacons do their smoke. They don't hide it. But anyway, the night you missed or the morning may have been the time that God had a special word on healing or after the message as he sometimes does anoints with the gifts of healing and you've claimed a certain healing of a certain ailment and it's important to you that left ear infected or back trouble, pain, whatever it was, and there was the anointing and you weren't there because of lack of interest or, well, the fog seems to be setting in or whatever. And you missed it. That was your night. You know what? You'll probably be waiting quite a while for the manifestation of that healing. God has a way of chastening those whom he loves and that's one way. It may have been instruction in a special area of why you're missing God in prayer. Next week, Lord willing, we're going to be dealing with prayer and dealing with an area where some of you are missing it. Now, you see, he just keeps pruning back and pruning back and trimming off where the branches that he's trimming. So he gets us way back to the vine so we'll bear a lot of fruit in this end time. And so these are some things, like one thing this church is doing about prayer, and they don't realize they'll never in a thousand years get an answer. And you do it every week. But you see, that isn't criticism because if you just took all that God has taught you, think about the Sermon on the Mount, non-resistance, and God isn't in the business of having secular education taught by the church or religious incorporation or... We could name 50,000 other things, taking the oath. What if God gave you all of that in a bucket the size of one of these concrete mixers, you know, those buckets that they build dams with and they hold about three stories of cement at a time. What if he just dumped all of that <laughs> right in here on you at first? You couldn't handle it. So he gives you these things, gives us all these things. You know, I learned to, as we can handle them. 
And so be present next week because I'm going to show you where you've had a hindrance to prayer and you've been waiting for a manifestation or an answer and so there was a time to present it. I didn't know it was happening and so when the Lord showed me what so many of you are doing, you'll see how to get delivered from that hindrance to your prayer. Well, what if you weren't there? And I don't want a show of hands. How many of you, if you're not here, bother to get the tape? And listen to it. I don't want to embarrass some of you. And I know how many are not here, and there may be valid reasons, because we recently had a message that was required listening for anyone that's a member or part of Faith Assembly. You'd be surprised how many, many have been up here asking for that tape. I don't ask them, why weren't you here? But some volunteered. My baby was sick or furnace out or whatever. And that's between them and the Lord. I don't mean something contagious, but a good place to bring a baby is where the faith's being preached. Well, that's another story. We don't want that misinterpreted because we've had people bringing their children in here with the whooping cough and the spots with the chicken pox and all that trying to prove its faith. That isn't the baby's faith, and you can't at that point prove a thing by bringing a baby out in public. You never know when you say something what you're going to have to say to say what you didn't mean. But I trust all of that got through. I don't know why they were absent. That is what I'm talking about. But a lot of people missed that most important message. If you had a valid reason, that's your business. No problem. I'm just saying that if you have baby bucket interest and you think, well, I can get the tape and make it up, it doesn't work that way. Now, if God wants to work it that way, make an exception, sometimes he does, that's all right. But when you say, Lord, now that I've gotten out of the way what I think is important, now I want to do a deep study of your word about prayer, since we're talking about that, don't be surprised the Holy Spirit just doesn't drop all he's doing in the rest of the universe and rush to your side and teach you all those deep things you need to know about the Word of God in prayer. You may find some pretty hard plowing about something you're praying about. You may find the crop is taking a long time to mature where you're ministering, or maybe it's your life. We're not just talking about ministers. You may find some of that pruning that God does on you is exceptionally painful for some reason. It's just because you had that little bucket interest in the Word of God. I mean, you believe it, you're not resisting it, but you're not exactly on your face crying out, Lord, I've got to have more of this Word, more of your presence. If you do some of that, you might get revelations like some of us do, like I just shared with you, but God knows your heart. And you may find the pruning pretty painful in some areas. And your crop is very slow in maturing. And you've got some hard plowing to do out there. And you don't know why. We're telling you why. It's got to be God's word, your life. Faith assembly where God sets you is your life. You don't have a job and you come to church. This is your job. This is your occupation. This is your calling. That would be true anywhere a true church is established. All of that's been taught in our teaching on the church and so forth, nothing new. But those who bring big buckets get them filled again and again and again. They never lose a thing. And they're just able to move into a new dimension when God presents it to you. They don't have to say, well, wait a minute, I'm still chewing on that last loaf. And here's another one. And no room on the shelf for any more. What am I going to do with it? So they lose it. It's bad enough put it on the shelf, but at least you can look at it occasionally and say, I'll take it down. I don't recommend you do. You know that. But when you've got so much up there in your little bucket, you're losing it. You get about what you expect to receive. I remember during my college and seminary days, some students would carry a briefcase and things in it, you know, because they had an interest in the courses they were taking, preparation, but I noticed in both college and seminary, some students would come to class, now believe it or not, with a sheet of paper in one hand, pencil in the other. Well, obviously, they didn't have any real interest in what was being taught or their own preparation because they were going to be out there in the ministry one of these days. They didn't expect much. They didn't want much. And their grades reflected that they didn't get much. 
And I could never understand that because I always carried a big briefcase and I had textbooks in it. I had my Bible in it. I had notebooks. I had pens and pencils and erasers and pencil sharpeners and other things. And sometimes I would have my lunch in there if I could find room because I wasn't planning on going anywhere until I got all for that day that God intended I should get. And as a result, God gave me all A's and I earned all of their degrees. While the others barely made it through, some didn't make it, and I don't know what they're saying now because they didn't have too much to say then. I occasionally heard what they call preaching. But my interest was to get it all. That's what I was going there for. Now, I don't mean that I swallowed hook, line, and sinker things that they taught that was out of line with the Word of God, but you know what we're saying by way of illustration. And yet some people will come to the meetings week after week with their little old thimble-sized buckets and after a verse or two or 10 or 15 minutes in the message they lose it all. It just spills out on the ground they lose it. I remember over in another place where we used to meet I mean this literally it exemplifies what I'm talking about there was one man that after you were 10 minutes in the message you could almost time him maybe 15 occasionally would get restless and he'd have to get up and go out and get some fresh air, get his mind on something else, because you see, the Word of God had so saturated his little thimble-sized heart that he had for the Word of God that after a verse or two or a few minutes, he lost all else. But compared to him, you would see people on the front row, and as I say, don't make that anything except by way of illustration, because sometimes I've been on the second row, and I had a big interest there's a brother that I know has got an interest on third row, so we're not talking about rows, but <laughs> people would come in, get on the first few rows with their big buckets and that hungry look on their face. <laughs> and you'd be an hour and a half before you got finished, and I've already been an hour and I'm not finished, and they would say, my, I thought he just started. And the baby bucket believers, when you got done in that meeting, after an hour and a half, they go, I thought he was going to go to midnight like he's threatened <laughs> to do. Well, you see, only you know where you're at. One day, God's going to call you to account to see the size of your bucket, what you've been carrying to the meetings. Some people, you have to look twice to see if they've got a needle and thread in one hand because their bucket's about the size of a thimble, and you thought it was a thimble, and maybe they're going to do some darning or something <laughs> while they're trying to listen to the Word. Well, let me give you a second reason why God wants you to carry the biggest bucket you can find besides the spiritual reason we've given you, and that is to get His bread that He serves up to you. The second reason is not only have a big bucket to receive the spiritual bread, but literal bread. That is in the sense of God's promises. Whether it's healing, financial need being met, you have to make a decision, and so you need wisdom, James 1, and so forth. And again, people are going to get about what they expect. God wants you to carry a big bucket as evidence of your faith. You remember... Bevington, I think we mentioned him last week. I don't know why he keeps coming to mind, but Bevington and his experience with his little and big bucket. God wants you to carry a big bucket because that's evidence of your faith. Just briefly run that account by you again, how that Bevington back in the last century, a brother who could pray heaven and earth together, a great man of faith. Before he ever heard about a faith message, he had faith. And in this particular incident that he recounts, it was the days of the cisterns and the wells, and it was in a dry period of the year, and he happened to be one of the few people who had any water in his cistern, so he gave water to his neighbors until it got down to where it was kind of getting tasty, you know, breakish. Don't ever look in a cistern or a well, or you'll never drink out of one, because down the bottom is where everything goes. 
But anyway, it got down to where it was tasting, and so the neighbor said, you better stop, you know, giving your water away. You won't have any for yourself, and there's no water around in the neighborhood. He said, oh, well, the Lord will provide. And so he got down to where it was getting tasty, so he just claimed that there would be, it was either two or three feet of water in the well. He said, the Lord will supply it, and he went around testifying to it like he always did, and people laughed, you know, like they laugh at you. He had claimed the water, two or three feet of water to be in that well, the next morning, and he said the devil awakened him in the middle of the night and said, you've made a fool out of yourself. You've testified in public. There'll be water in that well, and it hasn't even rained. Well, he said, I answered him, said, I didn't pray for rain. I prayed for water. <laughs> I went back to sleep, and he said, I got up the next morning. And of course, if you know anything about cisterns and wells, that a bucket goes down to pick up the water, and you crank it up. So he said he picked up his little quart bucket started out the door and the Lord spoke audibly directly to him and said, Bevington? He always knew what that meant. <laughs> Where are you going with that little bucket? He said, I repent, Lord. He didn't have to explain it to him. Some people have come to me wanting explanations of what God has said to them. But that's another story. He said, I repent, Lord. And he said, I went back and got the big bucket, the gallon. Because you see, a little quart bucket, you could dip it down in a well, and you could get it full, and you could say, see water. God gave the water. But a gallon bucket, a big bucket, if there's only a few inches of water in the well, you'll come up with just a little in the bottom of the bucket. So faith would carry the big bucket. Well, the story is, I guess you remember it now, since everybody, I suppose, has read Bevington. He put it down by faith. He said he didn't put a stick in it to see if there was water there. He put the big bucket down and up he came his bucket full of water. Fresh water, good tasting water. So the point to the story or illustration I'm giving you from Bevington is always carry a big bucket. And it's not faith to have a little bucket. You need big bucket faith. I mean, if you've only got faith for a used car, then stay with the word until your faith can reach out and appropriate what God has for his children. I'm not saying, you know, try to create faith by saying you believe something or claim something you don't have the faith for. But if you keep bringing your big bucket to the meeting, you're going to find that it gets filled every time in the right meeting. And then it's going to come true in your life that you can reach out, your faith can, and embrace all that God has for you. Because, Romans 10, 17, faith will come by hearing the word of God. I've heard people say, well, you don't understand. My faith is so small. People say that to me, say that to you, I suppose. But you know, it's no wonder if you look at the size of the bucket they're carrying. Remember, always carry a big bucket. And people say, but big buckets cost so much. Yes, they do. And big buckets get so heavy to lug home after you've filled them with all that heavy bread from heaven. Yes, they do get heavy. And you say, when I used to go to man's religious store with my bucket, he always filled it with such light, fluffy, sweet-tasting bread. Why is it that the bread from heaven is so heavy? <laughs> Why does it cost so much? Why is it so expensive? Why is it sometimes it has a bitter taste? It leaves a bitter taste in your mouth after you taste it. Yes, sometimes it does. But if your heart's right, it's sweet after it gets down here. The bitterness comes because, you know, you're being pruned by God with his word. People say, my, I used to go to church when I could just sit and rest and be entertained by a choir. And if I put a dollar in the offering plate, my conscience wouldn't even speak to me for at least a month. It was at ease. And the minister would come on with those delicious, precious little Reader's Digest Ladies Home Journal sermonettes that inspired you. And you come on here, Faith Assembly, with that strong meat, that heavy bread. And we're still chewing on last week's loaf, and here you're offering us another one. Well, if you took your case to a spiritual doctor... And you were complaining like that, he would ask you, you say you have no appetite for solid food? You say that anything real nourishing leaves a bitter taste in your mouth and about the only thing you can swallow and at least keep down is some of that light religious box mix <laughs> drive-in food that you get served up today? That's the only thing you can keep down? The doctor would say there's a lot of this going around. It's contagious. We're finding that 
Many people are reporting in the churches that good, nourishing, solid, spiritual food makes them nervous, causes their breath to come in short gasps. You know, when the preacher says something real strong, serves up a nice slice of warm bread direct from heaven, they go, did you hear that? So their breath comes in short gasps. They've got religious indigestion and spiritual heartburn. Are you ready for the diagnosis? You better call your wife in. I think you need to hear it together. Our husband, as the case may be, because what you've got is generally terminal. It's called anti-bibliitis. <laughs> anti-bibliitis. It's a form of spiritual allergy. It comes from staying too long on the non-nourishing wrong kinds of spiritual food. Maybe from feeding yourself on too many superficialitis malts. Some people get to the place where they can no longer even stand the sight or smell of this nourishing bread from heaven. They say that it makes them ill. It makes their hearts palpitate. Actually, they have a nervous reaction when the word gets too strong. In fact, we find that people can no longer even stand the sight or the smell of the bread that the ministers are taking out of the oven. They begin to break out in a spiritual rash. They get up and wander about with a look on their face like a zombie, muttering to themselves, my system just won't tolerate much more of this. If that preacher really loved us as he says he does, he would have more consideration for our feelings and understand that we're so sensitive to strong meat that he keeps dishing out. Now, if you went to a spiritual doctor, that would be the diagnosis of your case. That would be God's diagnosis of your case. You've got anti-bibliitis. You can stand anything but the Word of God. As long as it's the Word of man, it'll go down smooth. It's light and fluffy, saccharine sweet to the taste. The Word of God is costly. The bread from heaven is heavy. And sometimes, like when you used to take medicine, it's like a bitter pill. It'll leave a bitter taste in your mouth. But if your heart's right, so I said, it'll leave a sweet feeling and taste in your heart. Now, if you don't have that reaction, if it's still bitter after it gets down there, what you need is a new heart. So you need to go to the heart specialist. Get a new one. When you get a new heart, you'll have a new appetite. And you won't be able to stand the sight of that religious drive-in, box-mix, junk food that so many are offering today because you'll discover it's not nourishing. In fact, you'll find little poison in it now and then. Well, let's come to a third reason why God wants you to carry a large bucket, and that's over in Amos 8.11. Let me read Amos 8.11 to you. God wants you to carry a big bucket because the time is soon coming when the true bread's going to be in short supply. And he wants you to have plenty to see you through the famine. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord God, that I will send a famine in the earth, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. Amos 8.11. Multitudes of people are not disturbed or concerned about that warning, that prediction. They're thinking, well, it's either yet future or it was in the past and related only to Israel since it is an Old Testament prophet. And therefore, since I own a Bible, I can always turn to the Word. I'll have it. And I know a church or two around the country that does preach an uncompromising Word, at least sound doctrine. And people are deluding themselves into thinking, you know, that there's a famine going to come. God wants you to know there's already a famine in the land of hearing the true word of God. There's already a famine upon us. People are being fed on the husks of religion. Charismatic compromise. Bread filled with man's unnourishing yeast or sometimes poison. You say, isn't there a greater famine coming to fulfill Amos 8.11? Yes, I believe there's a greater famine coming, but how much greater can the present famine become that we're already in? I mean, just turn on the radio to the religious programs. 
Read your religious journals. Go to almost any charismatic or non-charismatic religious meeting. Open your religious mail. What do you find? How can there be a greater famine of the Word of God? Look at the people round about you. They're starving. They're languishing. They're dying and they don't even know what they're starving and dying of or from. Because they're feeding on man's religious bread and it just won't nourish you. You'll starve to death. And a lot of us got poison in it. All the heirs from JDS to shepherdship, you can name it. It's got poison in it and so you're either going to end up dying of the poison or starving to death. Literally, I mean this literally, look about you as you go about. I'm saying people who profess to be Christians are starving and literally dying many times because they won't eat the bread of healing or whatever God has promised them. The tragedy is that you can sit right here at Faith Assembly and starve to death because of your baby bucket interest in the Word of God. How much of this precious bread does the custodian have to sweep up around your chair after you leave because you had such a little baby bucket it just fell around you, you lost it, and it was wasted? Why is it some people can go through a trial and come out of it victorious? Any kind of a trial. Walk in victory 365 days a year. I'll tell you why. It's because they bring big buckets expecting the bucket to be filled. And the buckets are being filled for those who have big bucket interest, filled with the Word of God, filled with His truth. Therefore, their hearts, which are really the buckets, are filled with faith. And this famine that is going to come is already here. It's going to get worse. Amos 8, 11. It's going to get worse, but it's already here. And when the famine breaks upon us in all of its intensity, those who brought big buckets over the weeks and over the years will have all the bread they need. And there will be none extra for anyone else. That's the remarkable thing about this bread God serves up. There's never enough for anyone else but yourself. Remember the parable of the ten virgins. Five prepared with their big buckets of oil. Five were foolish. They didn't prepare. And when they said, give us of your oil, they say, oh no, not enough, just enough for myself. That's one place that being selfish is going to be the way that God works it out in the end time. Selfish in the sense that you can't give away what people wouldn't receive when God was offering it free. There's only enough for you. How are you going to get faith, that bread of faith in somebody's heart when they're standing on the brink of tragedy? They're looking... 666 in the face or something. When they're faced with having to believe God to survive and they don't have the faith for it. And you only have time enough to escape the wrath or the judgment or the situation yourself by faith. Maybe you have to walk on water. How are you going to bring them along? They don't have the faith for it. That's the only way you can escape. Sometimes there may not be water there. It'll take more faith you know, water can hold some things up, like boats. And sometimes, and it's happened in the past, you'll need something besides water to walk on. You'll need your faith, and that's all you'll have. You can't get that unless you get it now. No makeup exams. Don't say, I can get it off the tape, because the average person, I'm persuaded, doesn't even bother to get the tape. So how's he going to get it off of it? And you know better than I what your interest is at that point. If you believe this is an end time work, an end time message, and that whatever God is saying, so there be no gaps in your preparation, you're supposed to be getting it. Have you been getting it when you missed it? And even if you have the attitude because of your lack of interest, your baby bucket interest, that I can get it off a of tape, remember you can't get it off of anything unless the Holy Spirit gives you the understanding. All you've heard is words, the letter of the word. You can't apply it to your life. You don't know what to do with it. So, well, I heard it, and so that makes God pleased because at least I got the tape. That isn't what we're saying. There's a place for tape ministry when that's all you've got, and the Holy Spirit can quicken the word to you. I'm saying if you have the attitude 
that, well, I can always make it up. Even if you bother to get the tape, you can't make anything up unless the Holy Spirit gives you the ability to understand it and apply it. Father, we ask in Jesus' name that those who have been carrying the little baby buckets will see the need of getting straightened out, getting their priorities straight while there's yet a little time because the hour is so short that ministers will heed the warning in the prophecy and give themselves totally to the word. Let nothing interfere with their preparation, their prayer, and that the people who sit under our ministries will not neglect to have a large heart to receive all that you have for them week after week in the time that you ordained that we should have, whatever time is left. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Stand with us, if you will. Put the word into practice that you heard tonight. Treat it as solemn, serious. That it's God's grace that only allows us to touch this book. It's God's grace. That's how holy and awesome it is. Amen. Amen. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. Praise the Lord. Let the Lord deal with your heart on the basis of the message. God bless you. We'll see you Wednesday.